Jesus is marching on. Good morning. That was my Easter family this morning. And good, good having you all here this morning. I knew, without a doubt, I could not present this in the way Brad Stein does. Brad Stein is a Christian comedian, but he's also a solid Christian in his beliefs and what he portrays. And I knew I couldn't do it as good as him, so I decided we'll just let him do it. And I'll follow up a little bit there. How about that? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this day to you, Father, as we celebrate the life, the death, and the resurrection of your Son. Father, we thank you that we're capable to come here and be in worship. Father, that we have the freedom to do so. Father, I pray that you come and sit among us, that your presence be felt throughout this building, that each individual here would feel you're sitting right with them. Father, I pray today that the words I provide come from you. Just hide me behind the cross, Father, and let you be revealed in everything we say and everything we do. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give the glory to you. Jesus, holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, today across the country and the rest of the world, Easter is being celebrated by many. No matter whether the sun's shining brightly or there's rain falling or that rarest occasion where some people are getting snow, today is the day that we as a church celebrate to its fullest the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made a way for all people to be rescued, restored, and redeemed through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. If you join me this morning in your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 19, beginning at verse 38. And once again, as I always say, I pray you brought your Bible. Let's take God's word for it. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at it together. John chapter 19, beginning at verse 38. And where we pick up here, Jesus has already been crucified on the cross. We pick up at verse 38. It says, later, Joseph and Emmerich asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 25 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was a, the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This kind of gives us a preempt uh, of uh, what happened after Jesus was crucified and his body was moved. So let's pick up at verse 20, if you'll join me there. Just over, scroll on down a little bit or to your next page. Uh, John chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. It says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon, Peter, and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They hadn't grasped that as of yet. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. And now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? You have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. 
At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he said these things to her. Then if we move on down, and, and actually in verse 19 that we're going to pick up right here, this piece of scripture here actually confirms that Jesus rose again because it says they were basically hiding in fear. And you remember what Brad said, you'll remember this. They were hiding in fear. They they didn't want any part of this. They thought they made a mistake believing in Jesus, all that he said. So they're hiding in fear. But as they said, what was it that happened that made them come back and start preaching and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ that he had risen? Why? Because they saw him and they believed. Amen? So if we pick up at verse 19, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. They saw and they believed. And that's where we come to where we're at today. It's maybe we don't see. Maybe we don't see Jesus standing beside us. But we do see the miracles of Jesus each and every day in some way or another. If you just look for them. And we've given the choice to believe or not believe. We've given the choice of heaven or hell. It's that simple. And these guys, even though they were scared to death, they came back and started sharing the gospel again, knowing that it could lead them straight to death. And many were martyred, like he said, besides John. And they did this because they knew the truth and believed the truth. And you know, you say, why are you telling me this story, Reggie? This is Easter morning. I've heard this story over and over again as a Christian. Maybe you have. But maybe someone sitting here today that doesn't know the story and doesn't understand the story. We want to make sure everybody gets that right. Because you have to understand this. Even though we've reviewed the story of the resurrection, and once again, we have a choice to believe or not, some people have a hard time believing because they don't understand the story and the purpose. And there are many people in this world that like to lead us into not believing that this event ever occurred, or not to believe in Jesus Christ at all. Because it's said this way with, with all the attachments that go along with Easter. It's a pagan holiday. That's what you get from them. It's considered a pagan holiday. Look at all the attachments, the eggs, the bunnies, the Easter lilies, everybody getting all dressed up and all this, you know, all the Easter stuff, all the Easter hype. All these attachments, that's just, that's just a sales deal, man. That has nothing. That, why, why would you believe in a story like this? Well, some of the attachments are fascinating and harmless, while others are twisted in a way to turn the message of Jesus' resurrection upside down. The Bible is very clear. We should be able to separate attachments, right? And understand the real story. Some of those attachments, they come in many shapes and sizes of Easter baskets filled with plastic colored eggs, chocolate candies for them kids to get all hyped up, and all the other goodies that come with that. They're little stuffed animals in the shapes of Easter bunnies, ducks, lambs, 
and many others of those cute furry animals, not to mention the live ones get purchased every year. Even all the Easter lilies are blooming and all these attachments seem to have attached their self to the Easter celebration. You say, well, that messes the whole thing up. That distorts the whole thing. It can, unless you understand the story. The only time these things could be harmful is if we allow them to completely replace or remove the cross, the tomb, the angels, and, of course, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the only time they become harmful. We can take things like that and we can they can benefit us in a way to explain the story of Jesus Christ also. We should be able to have all these other things that are attached as long as we center everything attached around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's take a few moments to look at the oldest symbols or the oldest symbol that has become attached to the Easter celebration. It's pretty simple. Many of you may not know this, but it's real simple. The oldest symbol attached to the Easter celebration is the egg. That simple. And it's one of the oldest symbols used to speak about faith in both Judaism and Christianity. Both. Jewish people have used the symbol of the egg to teach about faith for centuries. It didn't just come about. It's been about for a long time. And a lot of people have a lot of problems with that. And that's why they try to distort what Easter is all about. The egg is a symbol of new life. A life of freedom from the bondage of sin in our lives. Before Jesus, sacrifices were offered at the temple. And when it was impossible for a family to provide a lamb for the Passover meal, an egg was used as a substitute. The egg enabled families that were poor and incapable of providing a lamb the opportunity to still celebrate the Passover and not be left out. In early centuries of the Christian faith, we find that a great deal of symbolism of Judaism was adopted by the early church. One of those symbols was that egg. The egg became the great Christian representation of new life, the resurrection, and the spiritual foundation in our lives. And just as new life would emerge from the natural shell of an egg, the church spoke of the new life that emerged from the shell of Jesus tomb it represented the resurrection life the egg became one of christianity's first object lessons and an evangelistic tool for all of them to use people even gave away eggs as a way of greeting one another in the name of jesus christ if you remember in the in the early days the mention of jesus christ or if you mentioned that you were a follower of jesus christ Bad things could happen. You could be persecuted. So what did they do? When one Christian met another and believed in Jesus Christ, he drew a fish in the sand. Amen? The symbol of a fish in the sand. The egg presented the same way. One Christian handed it to another. And it represented that they also were a follower of Jesus Christ. Through the years... The egg has become a great way of teaching people about Jesus. Not just children, adults too. And the resurrection and what it means to be born again. Even when John the Baptist met with Nicodemus, he talked about being born again and Nicodemus didn't understand what he was talking about. He said, how can I go back in my mom's stomach and be born again? He goes, that's not what I'm talking about. Be born in a new life, in a new way of life, through the Son of Jesus Christ. There is, however, out of the many color of eggs, that has become the favorite of all colors. Now you say, you know, I said that and I read this, that of the favorite of all colors. So I told Terry this morning, 
man, I need an egg. You need to go find me this color egg and all them kids' eggs back there in the back because we don't have time to color one. And we went looking through all them colored eggs and we couldn't find one the color we needed in all them eggs. The early church favored the red egg. We could not find one red egg and thousands of eggs back here in the back. They had every other color. So Terry colored this egg for me this morning. Took a marker and colored it all red to make the point. She'll eat it afterwards, she said. You know, the color red was used for some obvious reasons. Red would point to the blood of Jesus. It was shed on the cross of Calvary that day for us. The early church wanted to make sure that people knew it was the blood of Jesus that possessed the power to save us from our sins. So red was very, very important. Red was the color of life and victory over death is the way they saw it. You know, even though these attachments have found their way to be part of the Easter celebration, we need to, as each individual, ensure that the story of the resurrection does not get left out. I love it when in Scripture it says that Mary ran back to tell the other disciples that Jesus wasn't there. She was worried. She missed the resurrection thing there or had a hard time believing it. And then when Peter and the other disciples ran to the temple, I'm not sure if they were running out of fear or whatever. Or maybe they wanted to make sure all this was, was true. You know, why, why did they run? Well, I'll tell you this, what excites me that ties that scripture to Easter is when I see all these young kids line up looking at all them eggs on that ground and when they say go, they run to the prize. I would like to think that we would be running to Jesus Christ. Just like those kids are running to get those eggs because why do they run? Because they're excited. They're excited to go get those eggs. We should be running to Jesus Christ excited that he died on the cross to cover our sins, that we might have something when we leave this world called eternal life, heaven or hell. It's our choice, right? I'd say this without hesitation this morning. If it takes an egg or an Easter bunny to lead our younger people to Jesus Christ, bring it on. Amen? Use it in the right way. I pray today, as we enjoy all the activities that Easter brings about and has to offer to us, not forgetting what Easter is truly about. Keep Jesus at your forefront of your mind. You know, I don't want this sermon to be long. It's going to be short and it's going to be simple. But I want to tell you what. This is a full house this morning. Why is it a full house this morning, not every Sunday morning? Right? I want you to know if you're a visitor here, you're welcome every Sunday, not just on Easter. Amen? Because we love you just like Jesus Christ. And we don't want you to be part of this family and enjoy it. And grow closer to Christ. Which helps build your family, your foundations, and everything to do with your life. Jesus is the answer. Some of you may be here because somebody drug you here. Or somebody browbeat you to get here. Or you're a kid and you didn't have no choice. Right? You may be here for all those reasons. If you are, put that out of your mind. You're here for a reason. Believe it or not, Jesus Christ destined you to be here today, no matter how you got here. Amen? 
We pray that you'll be here again. Don't let this day pass you by. Jesus Christ has changed so many lives that I can have testimonies all over this church of what he's done for them in their lives. You say, well, how does that work? They made changes in their lives by accepting Jesus Christ. You say, wait a minute, I, I don't know about that change thing. Well, they're... Changes are good. I'm tough with changes. I don't like change that much, right? But the day I accepted Jesus Christ was the best change I ever made in my life. I'm not saying that just as a preacher or a pastor or whatever, as a human being and a person. It changed my life. It made it better, mine and my wife's. And it took time to understand that. Are you going to change overnight? Sure. In your heart, you're going to feel changes. But it might have took you 40, 50 years to get where you are today. So don't think you're going to fix all that in five minutes. Jesus can do it. He can do it. But it takes time to grow closer to Christ. You're here for a reason this morning. I don't know each one of you know what that reason is. But I will say this. If you're here today believing that you need to change things in your life before you can come to Christ, you're wrong. That's not the way it works. You don't have to dress up in a suit and tie. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it tells me what to wear to church. Jesus says, come as you are. Come as you are. I want to meet you right where you are. Paul on Damascus, on the road to Damascus, persecuting Christians everywhere, putting them in prison, in jail, whatever it took. Paul's doing that. Jesus met him on that road to Damascus and blinded him. But he met him right where he was, and he had to get his attention, and that's why he blinded him. And Paul became one of the most powerful Speakers and teachers for Jesus Christ to share the gospel than anyone else. He can meet us there too. You don't have to change to come to church. You don't have to change to come to Jesus Christ. Let him meet you right where you are. So that means come as you are. As we close this morning... I want you to reflect on this verse, John 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, not someone, not just maybe, no one comes to the Lord or the Father except through me. Jesus speaking, amen. So he says, come as you are. This morning, I'm doing something a little different. I'm going to close with a video and a song. I ask that nobody get up, move around, walk, do any of that. Someone here has got heartstrings pulling at their heart. This is by David Crowder. It's called Come As You Are. Okay. Now let's get serious. Some of you visiting today may say, man, I don't need that church thing every Sunday. I'm, uh, I showed up, man. I showed up at Christmas. I showed up at Easter. I got my time in. I don't need that religion thing. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. I'm going to say this to you. I've seen this over and over again. If you died today... Do your real relatives have to scrounge around to find you a pastor to preach over your service? If you become sick, maybe terminally, do they have to find someone to come visit with you, a chaplain at a hospital, or do you have a relationship with a family in a church that loves you and wants to be there for you when you go through those things? even if it's something simple that you just need prayer with. We can ignore that. I mean, we can say, hey, we're good. It doesn't work like that. 
Jesus wants to know you personally. Personally. He didn't want to know you on a part-time basis. He already knows you. You just may not know him. He wants to know that you know him. Amen? I hear from these people all the time. I say, man, I'm good. I sit at home in my pajamas. I can watch you online or I can watch them TV preachers. They got TV preachers all over the place. I can watch them. You know what I say to them? When you die, is that TV preacher going to be there? If you're in the hospital sick, you think he's going to come visit you? If you're a millionaire, he might. Excuse me, Lord. That's judgmental, I'm sorry. But it happens, right? We're not looking for any of that here at JBRC. We're looking to make you part of our family. Once again, God destined you to be here today for a reason. And you may be struggling with some things in your life. Say, man, I got to get all this fixed before I can even think about church. The Lord's going to meet you wherever you're at. Doesn't matter if you're at work. He can meet you at work. If you're with your family, you're driving down the road, sooner or later, something in your life's going to happen that God's going to get your attention. And he's going to give you an opportunity to come know him better at that point. It's up to you whether you grab hold of that. Life's short. Right? We're just a mist. That quick, we can be gone. And we see it happen every day. Don't leave here this morning not knowing where you're going to be when you leave this earth. Make sure you have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want to give you that opportunity this morning to know him. Let's pray. You know, if you're here this morning, you're struggling with some things. Or you say, man, I really don't understand all this. I don't know this Jesus guy. I've heard of him, but I really don't know him that well. Don't really understand what all you're talking about here, Reg. I, I don't know what you're, how you're talking about be born again and the whole thing. Well, it's a learning process. But you can have a new life. You can have a place to go when you leave this world and not a bad place, but a great place called heaven if you just pray this prayer with me. If you're struggling this morning or you're not, if you just say, hey, I don't really know how to get there, pray with me. Pray this prayer, simple prayer, easy as saying your ABCs. Pray this prayer with me. You can pray it out loud. You can pray it silently. You pray how you want to pray, but pray this prayer. Father God, I know I'm a sinner. i got some mess going on in my life, but I know you're going to meet me right where I am. Come into my heart. I need some changes. And Father, this morning, this morning I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that you sent your son to die that horrible death on that cross to be buried and raised again for the sins of my life, to cover all those sins and shortcomings that I have in my life. And starting today, I want that relationship. So I'm going to commit my life to you. Father, we know as we gather today, you hear our prayers. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give all the glory to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.